every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other
The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around For the Spirit of the Lord is here the atmosphere is changing now, for the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow. Hearts with your love, your love surround us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surround us. changing now just declare that declare that for the spirit of the lord is here the evidence is all around for the spirit of the lord is here just sing that again the atmosphere is changing now
much for your spirit thank you for allowing it to be apparent to us God so we can feel you all the time God just by this simple acknowledgement of you God thank you for allowing us to have the privilege God to just dwell in your presence God anytime we want God thank you for being alive in us God and giving us the power of your Holy Spirit God continues throughout this night, God, throughout our weeks, God. I pray that your spirit speaks to us, God, through this message tonight, God. I pray that throughout our week, God, you keep our eyes set on you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, God, amen. It's good to be in God's house tonight. Just to give you proper perspective, uh, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to call each other or see each other as brother and sister. And it's kind of cliche, and in a lot of places you go, they'll use those terms, but they really don't mean anything. But I want you to know that's what we uh, really believe in our family. Now, I have a a blood family. family that I was born into, uh, but I want you to know, just like Jesus talked about, these are my brothers and sisters. You guys are truly my family, and I love you guys, genuinely, and I hope you love me too, but I hope you also love one another, a part of each other's lives. And when we come to this house, this isn't, a, this isn't just any building, it's God's house. We meet God here, we meet each other here. This is a family reunion every time we come. And so, you know, I don't know about you guys, but that... I feel welcome when I come to my parents' house. 
they, they uh, sometimes lock the door. But a lot of times, I know the code so I can just get right in. And uh, I can go through the fridge. And, and guys, you can come in here anytime you want. You can go through the fridge even. Benny will let you. Just make sure you close it because it freezes up if it don't. And he yells at you. But anyway, this is a family. It's a family. We are family. Um, let me tell you about some family things coming up. This Saturday, we're going to do uh, another work night on the restrooms. I, I will say this. The bathroom, the men's bathroom is open. Uh, you can use that restroom. That door is kind of jammed halfway open, halfway shut because it needs to be trimmed. Uh, but it's perfectly accessible. You can use the sink. You can use the urinals, the toilets. Uh, one thing you need to know, though, you'll know when you go in, the, the stalls aren't done. So, um, you know, use wisdom with that. And uh, the, the urinals are, or the, the porta johns are still open outside. Uh, but anyway, this Saturday, we're going to have another work day on Saturday. Saturday morning instead of a typical Friday night we're going to do a Saturday morning if you can make it we'd love for you to come out and help us put the stalls together that's the one of the main things holding us back right now and we'll probably cut down the door as well and, and maybe the light can get hung uh, and get fitted up but uh, anyway Saturday morning at nine o'clock if you can come out we're going to do a work day that day and um, finally this family weekend we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now our biggest weekend of the year. It's our biggest service of the year. It's the night that we come on a Sunday night and we just blow it out. We bring all of our grandchildren, our children, our grandparents, our parents, our cousins, nieces, nephews, our neighbors even. We invite everybody to come out. We have a very family-focused message that night. It's a lot of fun, and uh, that is going to be the 13th, September the 13th. It's only two Sundays away. Um, and so we, we, don't, we don't have service that Sunday morning, so if you've got other family members that go to another church, go with them. But understand this, this is an excuse for you to get your unchurched family members to church. Okay, I don't care about your church family members. They go to church somewhere, great, I'm glad they have a home church. But we're really wanting to give as an opportunity for people to get their, have an excuse, get your unchurched family members here at church because God will move in their hearts and transform their lives, okay? The day before that is the really fun night, too. Saturday at 5 o'clock is our church family picnic. We're talking September the 12th. Everybody is welcome. It's going to be at the O'Banion's house this year like it has been the last few years. So uh, addresses will be going out. If I don't have your phone number, if you don't get my text messages from the church, then that means I need it because I can't send you the address and directions without that. So make sure you, sit, you give that to me. There are cards in the back. Jamie, raise your hand. Right there, I got a guy waving. Right behind him is the, is the uh, little box there. You can fill out one of them cards and put it in a box with your name and, and phone number on it. That way I'll have it, okay? But anyway, we'll have inflatables for the kids. We'll have games for the adults and the kids. Food, we got tons of food, okay? We're going to have the meat. We're taking care of the paper products. We're taking care of uh, all that type of stuff, the drinks. We want you to bring a side, bring a big side, okay? If you can, bring one to feet 20 or more because there will be a lot of people there. There's like 120 last year. Um, so anyway, it be a lot, lot, lot of fun. It starts at 5 o'clock. Don't miss it. You won't forget about it because I'll send you a text. All right. Did the preschoolers already dismiss themselves? They did, didn't they? If you haven't yet, you can be dismissed. Teenagers, you can go. And everybody here with me, get your Bibles out. If you don't have a Bible with you tonight, it's okay. We'll provide you with one. You will need a paperback, though. If you've only got your phone Bible, you can't win. you got to play to win. you got to have a paper Bible to play. I've been, I, I mentioned last week I was going to bring out some candy. So if you ain't got a Bible, hold your hand up. The ushers will bring you a paper Bible right now. I don't know. I got just some unique things. Some Kinder candy bars. I don't even know what these are. Some Kinders. They're the ones that do them Kinder eggs. I got Kinder candy bars. I got some Haribos. If you, if you get to the passage first, this is not, listen, I'm trying to encourage you. You got to know where your books of the Bible are at. You've got to be familiar with the Word of God. So we're not just studying the Word of God. I'm also helping you learn how to navigate it. Airheads. I got a two-pack of airheads. Whoever gets it gets a bunch of airheads. 
You can pick whatever you want. There's not a lot in this, but man, these are good. Have you ever had sweet tart ropes? That's my wife's favorite. We got a big giant Twix here. Two Butterfinger. That's a that's a combo pack. And then and then the M and the M. No Tootsie Rolls. Who likes Tootsie Rolls? Don't be like Tootsie Rolls. Don't even be lying. Don't even be lying. I don't believe I don't believe you, Toy. I think you're making it up. Okay, First Kings, chapter ten. Let's uh, let's go there in our Bibles right now. First Kings chapter ten. We are picking up where we left off last study. We looked at the second visit God made to Solomon. Okay, it was the first time he visited him, it was in a dream, and he said, "Listen, Solomon, I'm gonna give you whatever you ask me for." Right? Second visit, he was like, uh, "I'm gonna make sure." you know how to keep what I've given you because you can lose what God gives you. And so we talked about that last week. Uh, tonight, it's going to be the downfall of a nation. Where does it start? We're going to find out tonight. And uh, we'll pick up a chapter 10. I'll read for a little bit. I want everybody to follow along with me. And uh, if you have questions, shout at me. It's informal tonight, right? It's Bible study. We're always informal like a family. So you can raise your hand. You can shout out, whatever. Uh, we'll try to answer the questions, and uh, we'll learn together, okay? Let me fix this thing so I can sit on it. Chapter 10, 1 Kings. Everybody got a Bible? Okay, make it short. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relation to the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all of her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon, when she saw the palace that he had built, the food that was on his table, when she saw the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, The report that I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw it with my own eyes. Indeed, not even a half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report that I heard. How happy your men must be. How happy your officials who will continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and has placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. Hiram's ships brought gold from Ophir, and from there, the, uh, and, and from there they brought large or great cargoes of almug wood and precious stones. The king used the almug wood to make supports for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace, and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. So much algum wood has never been imported or seen since that day. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all that she desired and asked for besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. Stop there for just a minute. Who's the queen of Sheba? You may know. What? Tell you what. Close your Bible. 
We'll do a race real quick to a verse. Everybody close your Bible. You ready? First one there has to holler out. Raise your hand, something to let me know you got it. And then you get to pick one of the prizes tonight. But you got to read it. You got to find it first. You got to read it. Okay? Here we go. When I say it, you go. You ready? Are you ready? Okay. Matthew 12, 42. Right here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth, earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. This is Jesus. Okay, you, you go ahead from all the wealth of Solomon up here. Listen, this is Jesus talking about the queen of Sheba. He calls her the queen of the south. Now, different uh, theologians and commentators will say different things, but there's two main places they believe she's from. Go to the slide uh, next, Troy. Uh, so you can see... Up at the top middle, Israel is up there. Jerusalem's in there somewhere, okay? But they believe, many of them from uh, modern-day Yemen, which you can see where the dot's at. Uh, he called her the queen of the south. Some people think she's from Arabia. Some people believe from Ethiopia. And you can see the Ethiopia just to the southwest of modern-day Yemen. So this is where they believe she came from. He says from the ends of the earth. So she has traveled. She is an important queen. She's a, 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 people know about her, and she seeks out Solomon because she's heard about him. Now, I think it's interesting. She's also apparently a very righteous woman, though she doesn't live even anywhere near Israel. Jesus says she's going to stand up in the judgment. And this lady comes to Solomon. Look at verse 1. She came to test him with questions, but why? Because she heard about the fame of Solomon and his relation to the name of the Lord. Because of his connection with God. So she was a lady who obviously, and you saw what she said, she knew who God was. Incredible. So, so she's a righteous woman. She's from the ends of the earth. She's from very far away. She traveled. I'm talking like... If you measured out somewhere between 1,500 and 2,500 miles, that's a long way for someone to drive or fly, okay? But we're talking about camel. Now, there, potentially she went up through the Red Sea there and then took a caravan of camels at the end of it. Either way, it's a long trip. She really wanted to see for herself if what she'd heard was true. She didn't believe it, but then she found out it was more than what she thought. So here's a question. What was Queen of Sheba's response to seeing everything? What was it? We just read it. Amazed? Overwhelmed? Yeah, it wasn't even half. So following that up, what in particular impressed her that she saw? What impressed her so much? Okay, the wealth that he had. His achievements, she mentions his achievements, his wealth, his wisdom. It was, she wasn't even told half, so it was more than twice what she had been told about. What's that? All right, that's a big one right there that's easy to miss. She was impressed by the fact that she makes a statement of how happy your people must be. That they sit under this righteous ruler who gives them wonderful direction because she, she asked him all these questions and she couldn't believe that he could answer everything, that he knew all things. This was a gift from God. She heard it for herself and she says, now how happy must your people be to have you as their leader? There appears to be a direct correlation in God's blessing and people noticing if you have the favor of the Lord if you've been blessed by God you know this people should know notice people should see it 
People, it should be obvious to me. They might not believe it until they actually see it for themselves, but when they see it, they should be overwhelmed with, oh my goodness, look at your blessings. Look at how good God has been to you. What should, and I want to make a list up here tonight of this. What should people marvel at when they see the blessings in the life of the Christian? What should people marvel at when they see the blessings in the life of the Christian? I heard someone say, your joy. Okay. Okay, even in trouble. What's that? Okay. Where well, they handle things? Smiles? All right, faithfulness, consistence. Huh? Yep. Love, compassion, gratitude. Say it, Alicia. What is it? If you guys that don't know, Big T was the top, one of the top dogs of a Toyota. <laughs> when you come talk to him next time, you need to kiss the ring. Mark. All right, you're concerned for others? Okay. What else? Something that, yes. Okay. Or just no fear. Honesty? <laughs> yes, Lydia. think very practically now okay same kind of things but let's take more specifically more practically what are people going to marvel at when they see a believer what should they marvel at okay knowing God or you know maybe I should put it this way what do you hope they'll marvel at Okay, I'm going to get some specifics. Here you go. There you go. Kids. Family. The 
people around you, just like they did with Solomon. She marveled at the people around him, right? So I want people to, to, to be shocked by my family. Think, wow, this is different than what most families are like. Look at this family. They should marvel at that. They should marvel at, let's get really, really practical. They should marvel at the way that you drive your car. Somebody tried to shoot somebody down here in front of the Lowe's a couple weeks ago because of the road rage. Christians drive different. Should drive different. Joe's nodding his head no. But they should. But, but wouldn't it be incredible? But wouldn't it be incredible, right? Wouldn't it be incredible if it held true? Because it should. There should not be that type of behavior in a believer. If, if it, you know, so, so what if the police force realized that, man, I don't have to arrest anybody that goes to church. I don't have to pull anybody that goes to church. They're always obeying the laws. That should be a marvel. But see, that's the point. This stuff should challenge us to be more Christ-like. Because we want people, we recognize that people ought to marvel at the way that our lives are. We've been so blessed. It's not just our blessings, it's our behavior due to our blessings. Anything else I'm going to put up here? Okay. No, lack of anger. Jesus says that we should be slow to anger. That should be a marvel to people, yes. How can we put that in a <laughs> I guess it kind of comes in this knowing, personal, personal knowledge of God. Ability to pray and the results of that prayer. Jesus said these signs are going to follow people who believe, right? And then he listed off things like healing the sick, right? Miracles, yes. Not all Christians are blessed financially, but people should notice how a Christian handles their finances. Yeah, and they're blessed. One of the poorest people in the scripture was noticed by Jesus because of the way she handled her finances. Lady with the two minds. Satisfied. What's the scripture that says, um, be content, contentment with godliness is great gain. You can have all the money in the world and just be unhappy, but if you, if you have that godly contentment, happy with what you got, satisfied. So there are lots of ways that we can see that people ought to recognize us, notice us. They should marvel at us. Not that we're trying to be on display or have spectators, you know, we're not egotistical like that, but what I mean is our lives should be godly and blessed so much so people take notice and marvel at that because ultimately they'll want that. They'll want that. That will draw them to God. Sometimes. Yeah, it depends on the person watching you. Lord, make them mad at you and hate you because you're blessed. That happens too. Okay, let's continue reading. Verse 14. The weight of the gold. I'm going to have you read a couple verses here in a minute. We're going to test your skills. The weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 
six, six, six talents. I said it like that just because it was interesting that it says that. 666 talents. It really has nothing to do with the market beast, FYI. Not including the revenues from the merchants and traders and from all the Arabian kings and the governors of the land. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold that were 600 beakers of gold went into each shield. Seven and a half pounds. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold with three minas of gold in each shield. The king put them in the palace of the force of Lebanon. That was his palace. Then the king made a great throne inlaid with ivory, overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps, and its back had a rounded top. On both sides of the seat were armrests with a lion standing beside each of them. Twelve lions stood on the six steps, one at either end of each step. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's goblets were gold. And all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's days. The king had a fleet of trading ships. They were at sea along with the ships of Hiram. Once every three years they returned carrying gold, silver, ivory, apes, and baboons. Now that's interesting to me because I didn't know that that was a hot commodity. But apparently apes and baboons used to be what you're supposed to have. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. And then year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. Articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons, spices, horses and mules. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots. 12,000 horses which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful, plentiful as the sycamore trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Ku. The royal merchants purchased them from Ku. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150 they also exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the Arameans. Solomon was blessed. And this was the time to live in if you were a Jew. Because there were no other time they were this wealthy. Yes, Miss Sue. Right. Everybody that came, you're right, nobody wanted to take from him. Everybody that came wanted to give to him. They brought gifts every time they came. They just felt so honored just to be able to come and seek an audience with him, like it says here. They all just brought gifts just for the, he's had so much favor. So blessed. This was the time to be in. So richly blessed. Let me ask you something, because we're going to turn, the, turn a page here. Can a blessing be dangerous? How does a blessing turn into a danger? Think about that for a minute. How can a blessing turn into a danger? You get the big head? Okay, you get the big head, you're feeling like big stuff, Miss Toy? Okay, if that blessing is used incorrectly, sure. Amanda? Take it for granted where it came from? Absolutely. Yeah. He might be on to something. Yeah. Y'all hear that over there? Somebody got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Or they're just playing. right all right we're ready for these two verses 
Close your Bibles. Everybody's on the same page. Zero. Okay? The first one, get it. Raise your hand. Shout out. Come take your prize. I don't know what to tell you. You have to bring it. Listen, if you use that all the time, you should be. You should be. I'll give a little clue to you. You can't use your, your phone Bible. You can't. That's not a race. You got to use a paper Bible. I don't know where you was at when I gave that instruction. Listen, I'll just give you a little clue, though. A little clue. The fastest Bible you'll be able to use is a, what they call a thin line. A thin line Bible. They're only about that thick, and man, they're quick. I got a New American Standard thin line. I can turn in less than five seconds to anything I want to. Just a you know, little trick. If you want to bring on Wednesday night, get a thin line. Okay, here we go. Deuteronomy 8 11. Deuteronomy 8 11. I heard Lydia. Lydia, I want you to read through verse 14. Now, don't, we, we got like six more scriptures, so don't get upset. But listen to this verse. Listen to this verse. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Wow. you got to be careful. You can get so blessed, you get prideful. You get prideful, and then you forget where all your stuff came from. You know, Israel was famous for this. Israel, in the time of the, in the, time of the judges, would serve the Lord and, and, and thank Him for the deliverance that they received. And, and then, next thing you know, they forget how God delivered them before and how He blessed them and how He gave them. And they would just forget over and over and over again, and then they'd be punished again and fall out of favor with the Lord. We've got to remember, and we can't grow prideful. Like, what does it mean to be prideful? Well, to think a lot of yourself, number one. Hey, I'm rich. I'm awesome. Everybody look at me. We're the most wealthy nation. We have everything going for us. But it could be more than that. What if you have so much, you forget to keep talking to God and asking Him for what you need? Because when you, don't start, when you stop asking God, you think you're good enough to take care of yourself. It's bad. What's been taken? What'd you take? The twig? No, what'd you take? Oh, okay. I'm just curious. I got these too, but I got these for me. You sure? Yeah. But when God gives it to you to have a blessing because you've been faithful to Him or just because you have favor with Him and He just wants to bless you, you guys still got to be careful because you could lose it because you forget about God. Forget where it comes from. Remember to have gratitude. Remember to count your blessings. We talked about this this past Sunday. You know, we need to, it's not a bad idea to just get a thing out and write down the blessings, the gratitude, and remember to pray and thank God for everything that he's given you. It'll keep joy in your life. And it'll keep his blessings in your life too. Okay, close your Bibles. Deuteronomy 17, 16. That's why you had to close it. Deuteronomy 17, 16. All right, Jessica saw her first. Now, I want you to read through verse, I think it's 20. Let me double check. Yeah. 16 through, now listen closely. Listen closely. Here we go. 16 through what? 20, okay. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people of e return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be laid astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of the law taken from that of the Levitical, is that right? Levitical priest. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all of the words of his law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left, 
then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom. Everything God said not to do, he did. They said, don't accumulate a lot of horses and definitely don't go down to Egypt to get them. What did he do? He went down to Egypt and accumulated a bunch of horses. Big T mentioned it. We just read it. This is the, this is the Old Testament law that was given to the kings. As a matter of fact, yeah, I'm sorry, I always forget to remind Matter of fact, it says you need to get a copy of this from the Levites, from the Levitical priests. Get a copy of the Bible. Get a copy of the Old Testament law. And the king has to keep it with him. And he has to read it daily so that he knows what it says and doesn't forget what he's supposed to do and what he's not supposed to do. Where was Solomon at? Where was his Bible at? Why wasn't he in it? He might have had all kinds of wisdom, but he also got prideful. He didn't need the Word of God anymore. And he forgot what he was supposed to do and not do. So he's getting horses down out of Egypt. He might have justified it for himself because it says that he exported them to the kings of the Hittites and Arameans. Now, I don't know if that was all of them, but maybe he justified it that way. Oh, you know what? It's not so bad because I'm not keeping them all for myself. I'm also exporting them. So you justify your breaking of the law, right? So here he is doing that. Now, we haven't even gotten to this yet, but it says don't take a bunch of wives. Well, we know he did that. And then it says, don't amass great amounts of silver and gold. Now, it's one thing for God to bless you financially. It's another thing to be so focused on it that all it's doing is you're looking for more of it. And that's where he had turned to. He's like, I'm just going to keep amassing more and more and more. And became greedy. And that became one of his focuses is to look for more money, more money. And, it, and, it, and yeah, they were blessed, but, but he, he, was, he was too focused on the wrong things, you see. So he began to do all three of these things that the law explicitly says not to do, which he should have had in his hand beside his you know, body, reading it. But he didn't. So his blessing became very much a danger for him. And it began to lead to a downfall. Now let's start in chapter 11. We're going to end with this. We're not going to read through the whole chapter, just a, a few verses in it, okay? King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women, besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, quote, you must not intermarry with them. Why? Because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth, and 300 concubines, that's like a wife, he bought them, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord as his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites, so Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On the hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place, that was a place of worship, like a temple, for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and offered, that's like praying to, and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Wow. So why is it important? that we do not intermarry with them. Why was that the case? Why did, why did God tell him that? They would lead his heart astray. Close your Bibles. Got four prizes, four things left from the wealth of Solomon. 
Are you ready? 2 Corinthians 6.14 2 Corinthians 6.14 Who said that? Miss Debbie. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Yoked is like what they used to use for oxen. So they had, before they had tractors, they had something like this. And there'd be an ox here, and there'd be an ox here. And it would tie them together. They'd be bound together by this yoke. It was usually wooden, sometimes metal. And so two oxen would work together. Come on up here, Brother Joe. I need your assistance. So we'd be yoked together, and we'd be pulling We'd be plowing the field. Now the problem is, this oxen right here is weak. <laughs> and I'm strong. And when we're pulling, I'm going to be pulling him and the rows are going to be like circles. Because he can't pull his own weight. You see what I'm saying? But when you got two equally yoked oxen, we go like this. Straight rows. You can't plow a field in circles. Thank you, brother. Now that's what a yoke did. Now get that mental picture. If you're getting together and hooking up with somebody who does not serve Jesus, you're just spinning in circles. You're not going to do nothing for Jesus. It's absolutely pointless. You have got to stay away from that. Okay? Don't date someone. Don't marry someone who doesn't love Jesus. My prayer that I've been praying for over a decade for my children is that God would prepare for them spouses that would love God more than anything else. Do I want them to love my children? Absolutely, but I want them to love God first. More than anything else in this world, they must love God. And so what happens is Solomon doesn't listen to that. God told them, I don't want you any marrying with unbelievers. I don't want you having anything to do with them because they'll turn you away. He did it anyway. And it wasn't all at once for Solomon. It was a gradual fading away, as most of the time is when somebody begins to backslide. It's not immediate, like, I'm righteous and then I'm terribly backslidden and sinful. It's a slow fade. They slowly begin to fall away. It was one thing after the other. It's said that he didn't, in one of the passages, that he did not serve God completely. In other words, it was kind of a partial serving. You can't partially serve God and be successful. Because God won't be partially served. It's all or nothing. So why did Solomon think it was okay to marry so many wives? Riddle me that. He was obsessed with love? With their love. Obsessed with their love. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Why did Solomon think it was okay? To marry all those wives. Why? Say the scripture what? <laughs> scripture will take you deeper than you, you, you want to go? Well, that's what, that's what people say. They, you know, their own like commentary on it. So it did. His sin maybe drug him deeper. Maybe his beginnings got bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Why else? What else? Why did he marry all these women? Why was that okay? Why do you think it was okay? Okay, yeah. Okay, so Solomon had a lust problem, and part of it was sexual. Part of it was power. Part of it was not sexual at all. It was about making alliances. That's why it said he had 700 brides, and they were from royal birth. So it was, it was making some sort of power thing. Um, so he had a lust for power, not just a sexual lust. Why, why do you think it was okay, though? Why did, how did he justify it? I'm asking you guys. Why did he, how could he justify marrying all these women? Okay, I'll tell you. Number one, he didn't read his Bible. He didn't know what was right from wrong. All that wisdom and 
No common sense. Right? He's not reading in the Word. It tells him very plainly not to do that. Beyond that, there's a couple other reasons, though. Number one is this. Well, close your Bibles. Here we go. Everybody got them closed? Everybody ready? Shout it out. 2 Samuel 5.13 2 Samuel 5.13. I heard it over here first. Man, that was close though, Lance. He was a half second behind. Here we go. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. Did you hear that? His daddy did it. His daddy had eight wives and a bunch of concubines to boot. So he grew up with that. And you know whatever you do, in moderation, kids going to do in excess. That's what they say anyway. And he sure did. He took it all away. Daddy might have had eight wives. He says, you know what, I can do 700. What? He saw, he saw that in his father, and he did the same thing, okay? Here's, here's, another, here's another reason he did it, culture. You know if something's culturally appropriate, or legal, people think it's okay? It, it really is. I mean, I, I got friends that live certain places where certain other things that we would never do here, um, and we would justify that biblically, they do it there because, well, everybody else does it. It makes it okay. It doesn't make it okay because everybody else is doing it. You know, that was, a, that was a major thing in the Middle East. Then. It's still a major thing in the Middle East now. It, it's, it's still a major thing in Central America now, right? There's still these multiple wives. It's not okay. But you have to gauge it. You have to, that's why you have to know the Word of God. Only through knowing the Word. Now, what does the Bible say about multiple wives? Because we've already gone down that way. Is it okay to have multiple wives biblically? No? How do we know? Close your Bibles. You can't win it twice. I'll just go ahead and throw that out there because I know some of you are still going. That's okay. For pride, you might go ahead and say, I got it, and I'll still say, acknowledge it. Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24. Who was the first one that said it? Okay, Jessica. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, I got one more. Close your Bibles. Words. Here we go. Close your Bibles. It's the last one. Come on up, Jessica, and get yours. Ephesians 5.31. Five thirty one. I saw Susie. Five thirty one. Wait a minute. Oh Donna, where is it? Oh, this Bible, I don't know it. Okay. For this reason the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Jesus repeats it. What God said in Genesis, his design was one man and one woman. He said, a man will leave his father and mother and cling or be united to his wife. And it, then he said, and the two of them will become one flesh. He didn't say, and the 12 of them will become one flesh. He didn't say, and the 1,000 of them will become one flesh. That's not right. It's the two of them that become one flesh. So, yeah, there's no way not to justify it biblically. Yes. Uh, the Old Testament conviction is different than New Testament conviction. Holy Spirit didn't dwell them and do that stuff, but the law would condemn them, and the law was strict. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. 
they, they did not have any kind of punishment for that. So they got away with it, right? They got away with it. And it's like when, when um, lots of the things in the Old Testament like that. So they got away with it. They did it anyway. And it, it's, it's mind-boggling to me. But that, I mean, this is the grace of God, I guess. Because our, our forefathers, our Jewish forefathers, all pr participated in this in some way. But that is not the way God planned it. So don't judge or justify it. Okay, anybody here crazy enough to go take more than one wife? You're an idiot. Okay, I just throw it out there. Okay. Here we go, final, final statement. The downfall of a nation begins when it morally declines. The nation of Israel just began, really. I mean, it's got a long life left, but it's already started the downfall. It has already begun. Because the moral decline is what causes it. It's not the finances. It's not when there's financial decline. It's moral decline. Should the Lord tarry, now listen to me. Should the Lord tarry, America's in trouble. America may not survive, to be completely honest with you. But I will tell you this, if you look in history, when a nation collapses, the Christians are always benefited. They're always blessed. Think about when Israel collapsed and they went to Babylon. It was for their good. It helped them. It was a time of uh, separation from Israel, but it wasn't time of separation from God. But if the Lord should tarry, America's in trouble because of the moral decline. Only righteous leadership can salvage and reverse the trends of a declining country. You must have moral, righteous leadership. The difficult thing about that in America is this, because we're a democracy, is not that its ruler has to be righteous first. The people must first be righteous because they must elect a righteous leader. So what's the answer for America? If we're going to slow the decline or turn it on its head, it means revival. We have got to have revival. We've got to have not just this church, we've got to have every church seeking the Lord and obeying his word and seeing people come to Christ, doing the great commission that Jesus gave us. And it's only in that revival that we will actually see any kind of reversal. Otherwise, we're in a lot of trouble. And it, and it always has. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, we read about uh, a group of believers, false believers. They were called the Nicolaitans, and they had messed up doctrine. And it was one of those things, like Jesus talked about, there's going to be a time, there's going to be a day when people will go wherever the itching ears are satisfied. You know, they'll go somewhere that feels comfortable for them. And, and the essence of it is this, and I've said it before. Here's the essence of it. People want to make God in their image. If I can make a God, if I can fashion an idol that looks just like me, wants what I want, does what I do, that'll be really easy to worship and, and serve. But that's the backwards. God said, I'm making you in my image. We must be made in God's image, not God in ours. That's what people try to do. And there are false churches then, there are false churches then, there are false churches now. You have to be very discerning. you got to know the word. Amen? All right. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word tonight as we study our history, as we learn what your word tells us about the beginnings and about your Jewish nation. Lord, help us to apply these truths to our lives. Help us to live by them. Help us to know your word. Lord, if we're learning, help us to grow. If we're young in this, help us to mature. 
Lord, I pray that all of us would continue to grow and mature as long as we're on this earth. Lord, let us leave here today and people notice our faith. Let us leave here today and people admire and marvel at the way that you have blessed us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said,